you guys. Good to see you. I have no idea what time zone I'm in. I'm, uh, I, came, I went from uh, New Zealand, was home for a short while, and then took off for winter camp, which was a blast. I missed that whole update. I don't even know what happened. Like, I left a bunch of people on the floor and had to drive home. That was all I saw. It was awesome. And then the next day, took off for Budapest, so that was crazy. And uh, just got back a couple days ago from Budapest and, and England. And uh, I do want to say this. Man, God is moving, in case you did not know. I, I just feel like I got a blessed front row seat. I don't even know how I got here, but God is amazing. And, uh, you know, if, if he can use me, he can certainly use you. And if you knew me, you'd know that's true. Um, and let me just tell you that uh, one of the things that I felt like there was a word over this house a while back. Um, there's so much going through my mind right now. I got so many things to say. But let me say this first. Uh, a while ago, maybe a year ago, I felt like there was a, a well of revival on this church. And I actually gave that word to Francis. Um, but I feel like I, I need to share this because it has to do with that. When I was in England, um, I got invited to share at a church uh, called St. Andrew's Charliewood, which actually uh, was Rachel Naramore's family's church for a little while, right? She, she went there. Um, but back in 1981, um, a man named John Wimber was invited there to uh, really come and introduce the Anglican church to the Holy Spirit in uh, Signs, Wonders, and Miracles, because they had really not experienced that. And so John Wimber went and then took his associate pastor, Blaine Cook, who's a dear friend of mine. And uh, in a roundabout way, uh, how the Lord just kind of connects dots and does things. I had had a word that I shared here um, a while ago, uh, talking about a man that I passed by in a meeting a year and a half ago. And uh, really, we were just releasing prophetic words over leaders in the region. And I didn't know who he was, but I only had one word and the word was jackpot. And it was an odd word, uh, but he was very faithful, and he wrote it down. And he ended up going on jackpot tours on Mount Kilimanjaro, and 37 people got saved and healed. And it was a crazy jackpot experience for Jesus. And so anyway, for, through that, uh, then he got on the plane, and he landed in Dubai, and he was waiting in Dubai. And the Lord uh, spoke to him and said he wanted him to look for uh, openings in the Church of England. And he said, no, I'm quite happy in my uh, small church in the other side of the world. And so he said, no, I'm, I'm happy there. And the Lord really pressed into him and said, no, I want you to do this. And there was only one job opening, and it happened to be at St. Andrew's Charlywood, which is very odd because uh, this is just now, a year ago. And uh, this man's t name is Tim, and he's always given me permission to share this story because it, it is the, the faithfulness of God who only gave me one word, which was jackpot. This man wrote it down, then ended up out of five tour companies, the only one that could take him was Jackpot Tours. And then he shared the gospel and he healed the sick. And then they all came to know Jesus. And that was a jackpot. But then in Dubai, when the Lord speaks to him, I'm just trying to tell you fast. Are you getting it? All right. So <laughs> in Dubai, when the Lord speaks to him and he says, no, I don't want to do that. Then he says, well, if the Lord's going to give me 37 souls on, a, on Mount Kilimanjaro and he's going to save them and heal them, I'm going to do what the Lord says. So he put in his paperwork thinking nobody would give him the time of day because nobody knew him, and St. Andrews is a, is a fairly high-profile church. Uh, it's well-known. Um, anyway, it's, I'd find the other, the, the interesting story was the three uh, pastors they narrowed it down to were all named Tim. It's very odd, isn't it? Anyway, they hired Tim, Tim Horlock. She was shocked. And so then he said to his wife, well, what a jackpot. This is absolutely amazing. Well, then uh, I run into him. He tells me the story a few months later, just when he starts the job. And he looks at me in this meeting that I'm in, which is in a different city. And he says, do you think you maybe someday might want to consider coming to St. Andrews? And I thought, yeah, <laughs> totally come there. So anyway, that's where we just got back from. Um, and I want to say this. If you're not praying, please start. Because here's what I saw. The Lord told me that the wells of revival were strong in that region, and I didn't know anything about St. Andrews. I just knew that the Holy Spirit had visited in a big way in the 80s. I mean, it was nuts what was happening there. Um, and it isn't that the Holy Spirit doesn't visit today, but not in the same manifestations of great miracles uh, are they seeing until last week. Uh, I'm, I'm nobody, honestly. I'm a daughter of the king. I know that, but I will just tell you I'm not qualified I just said yes, just like Tim said yes, and then he got the job. Maybe you should try saying yes. 
to those risky things. It's, so when I went there, here's what I discovered. There were a bunch of white-haired people in this church. There were a lot of other kinds of people, but there was a lot of white-haired people. And while I was standing in the pulpit the very first night thinking, what am I doing here in this church, Lord? And he said, you are here to bless the pillars. And I was like, well, who were those people? He said, all those white-haired people you see sitting out there. They have prayed this right back in. And so we did some lines where we prayed for people, and they came through, and the power of the Lord on these people was so strong that all, he's, all the Lord asked me to do was to bless what he was already doing. These people have prayed. They prayed in the Holy Spirit in the 1980s, and they're still praying. If you're waiting for a move of God, he's coming. You just can't stop praying is my whole point of sharing the story. All I did was go like this, and they went out. Boom. And I was like, that's absolutely stunning. Let's do that again, Lord. And so, you know, 10 more people would come through the line. And then he'd say, here comes a pillar. And another one would come. And I would just do this. And they would fall over again. They'd drag them off and they'd lay them, they'd lay them in rows. They were all laying in rows. And I thought, this is just extraordinary. But what was wild was when they got up was the tears on their faces in encountering God. And they said, you have no idea. We've pressed into this since 1980. Seven, when the manifestation of the miracles left. We've prayed into this since 1987. Day and night, we have been fasting and praying and asking the Lord to come back. And who does he ask to come? Who am I? I'm just a person that said yes. And then I got to have a front row seat of the glory of God coming on the sons and daughters who never stopped praying. So please, if you've given up, can you get back on your knees and start praying again? Because that's how revival comes. Revival does not come without prayer. And we're watching this whole manifestation of the Holy Spirit come in a way I never, never expected. And on top of that, what really was just unbelievable to me was 22 people showed up to pray with our team. Over five cities in the UK. That is unheard of. They just don't partner. We're talking three different churches, completely different church cultures. But they all said, pick me, pick me, I want to come and pray. And Tim Horlock is standing there, the vicar, brand new, eight months into this church, and goes, who are all these people? I go, well, they've come to bless your people. He goes, where are they from? I go, Barnabas Network Churches, non-denominational Christian church, and the Anglican church. He goes, I never, I've never seen this in my life. I go, me neither. Isn't it great? (laughs) I said, that's because you have praying people. Prayer brings revival. I mean, just... In the prayer team alone, we had revival because they came to serve and to bless. So I just want you to know God is listening to you. And, you know, I don't think that everybody has to wait from 1987, which is a long time, to now. But sometimes you do. And you just have to keep pressing in. Okay? Isn't God sweet? He's amazing. So um, anyway, I... I have to tell you, before I went to England, um, and that outpouring there, we were in Budapest, in Hungary, and you've heard me talk before about what's going on with the Hungarian college revival, and it is really staggering to watch. Um, we, I feel like we just had the privilege of going. Those, those guys have their own trajectory happening now, and there are um, thousands and thousands and thousands of college kids loving Jesus, and now it's gone out to the countryside, And uh, they're holding meetings out there. And it is starting to tip. You know, you just know when this renewal, this gathering of of hungry people is starting to tip into revival because nobody can be still about it anymore. It's like electrifying to be around them. And so our team uh, spent some time, a lot of time with their leaders, a lot of time with healing their leaders. But what was curious to me, was I had four sets of leaders from different places in the world contact me and ask me if they could go on the trip. Who am I to be the gatekeeper of Hungary? I I don't know. So I actually inquired of the Lord. I just said, Lord, are these people supposed to go? And for four of the sets of leaders, he said, no, they're, they're just trying to observe. We don't need observers. And I was like, all right, then I shall be the gatekeeper of Hungary, and I will tell you, no, you cannot go. I said, you know, you, you could go. You just can't go with us. That's all I said. Sometimes I have a boundary, occasionally. Anyway, so uh, then, then there was another set of leaders, and for that set of leaders, I forgot to inquire with the Lord. I just pretty much said no, because I said no to the other four, so I just said no again. And then somehow I got overridden. I'm not sure how that happened, but somehow I got overridden, and the next thing I knew, I got an email from one of our team members in England saying, oh, these guys are coming. 
And I was like, I thought I said no, but oh well, I guess I didn't. So they came, and it turned out to be the most amazing connection. Um, you know, when a nation has young people that are on fire for Jesus, do you know that they need moms and dads? Well, we can't be the moms and dads, the only moms and dads. We live in America, and we have ministries. We travel all the time. We're not as available to these young people as they need. They need moms and dads. They don't have moms and dads there because their moms and dads are Orthodox and Calvinist and don't believe in the move of the Holy Spirit yet. But Joel 2.28 is coming to pass. It's coming to pass. So anyway, these two guys that came, one of them leads a huge outpouring in Belfast uh, with Christ in Youth, and the other one leads a huge ministry in the UK and now going worldwide called Fusion, and they're both college ministries. And these two young guys are in their 30s, and they're on fire, and now they are going to step in. You know, sometimes God will send people from across the world to join you, and you never know who he's going to send. And I just want to tell you that as you think about what you want for America, probably Budapest is one of the most unlikely places you would see a move of God. It's one of the driest, religious, most con non-conforming nations. And I think if you could see what we see when we go, you would have hope for America. And when those three young men uh, that lead this whole revolution for Jesus came with me to Conum, the outpouring we saw there after they spoke, and they spoke in Kansas City, and we saw an outpouring there. I believe it's coming, and I believe our youth here at the Rock of Rosa are so on fire for Jesus that they're not only our hope, they are it. So if you're not pouring into them, you need to be. With just a drive-by encouragement, drive-by prophetic word, drive-by, hey, you're doing awesome, all of you. You're incredible. I love you. We need to do that. Um, we got to be maturing ourselves in the word of God, amen, so we can become those mothers and fathers. So um, I asked the Lord what to talk about uh, to this weekend. Thanks thanks for inviting me. I Seriously, I, I, I love being here, and it's just great fun. I love seeing all of you. Don't get here enough. Always gone. But uh, he wanted me to talk tonight about reckless faith. That's not a popular word, reckless, for most of us who grew up in the military families. Yeah? So uh, because military precision was my family framework, reckless was not in that value system, as you can imagine. So I was never allowed to engage in uh, reckless behavior. So when the Lord said, your faith has to be reckless, when I asked him what my word of the day was one morning, I really didn't, didn't understand that. So 1 John 2.27 tells us the anointing we've received from the Lord abides in us, and the Holy Spirit teaches us truth about everything. Yes? Right? So um, as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, well, Lord, if this is really you, then you're going to show me how this goes together. How does faith and recklessness go together? So let me show you, because I love when I am explaining something the Lord explained to me, I like to explain the process. So I'm always looking words up because I want to know what he's talking about. So faith means this. You'll know this. You'll go, yeah, okay. Complete trust or confidence in someone or something. A strong belief in God or in the doctrines of a religion. Can we all agree on that? That's a pretty good definition. All right, here's what the definitions of reckless are. Dictionary.com says, without thinking or caring about the consequences of an action. Okay? I don't get how that fits in right yet while I'm looking at this with, with the Lord. Then Merriam-Webster says, marked by lack of proper caution, careless of consequences. That doesn't really fit with faith either to me. And then we look at the definition we use for kids. That's so irresponsible. That's the one I heard when I was growing up. Every kid, that's so reckless, how irresponsible of you. But then the Lord pressed into me. He's like, you don't get it. And I'm like, clearly I don't. Let's all see how this goes together. As I started to look at the synonyms of reckless, here's what I found. This intrigued me. Impulsive, audacious. Now you are like, okay, I can almost buy this, maybe. Daring, courageous, fearless right? Advent over adventurous. Come on. Don't you want to be over adventurous with Jesus? Yeah. Impetuous, maybe. Reckless, 
faith as influenced in our Christian doctrine might sound something like this. So this is what I get dictated by. I just wrote it down. And I, I think we have the slide of this. So it might sound like this. If you're going to live with reckless faith and be a Christian, it would look like this. Living without cultural or religiously influenced caution by taking bold, daring, fearless, Holy Spirit-inspired, loving action to do what Jesus said I would do regardless of the consequences to me. Shall we read it again together? Isn't God great? I can't think that fast, so you know. Here we go. Living without cultural or religiously influenced caution by taking bold, daring, fearless, Holy Spirit-inspired, loving action to do what Jesus said I would do regardless of the consequences to me. Now, that's not just for five of us. That's not the agape freedom fighters. It's all of you. We'll be selling those tattoos in the lobby. <laughs> All right, so I want to go through some scriptures today to say reckless faith, the risk, the risk required for reckless faith is what you're created for. It's what I'm created for. Reckless faith is what Jesus modeled and paid for on the cross, right? But you can't have reckless faith because it's only born through intimacy with the Father. And it's the inheritance of Christ in us, intimacy first, risk second. And the third thing is that reckless faith is absolutely necessary for signs and wonders and miracles. No risk, no reckless faith, you're not going to see it. You're not going to see it. So number one, reckless faith, this risk is what we're created for. Without faith, we know it's impossible to what? To please God, Hebrews eleven six, Faith without works is what? Dead, James 2, 14 and 16. So reckless faith is the opposite of cautious Christianity. I can't stand cautious Christianity. Not even in myself, really. I just can't stand it. What are we waiting for, people? You already have the holy invitation. You're just sitting there waiting for it just to... Hmm. You know, it's just not going to fall in your lap. You have to get off the couch. Get off the couch. All right, so the Old Testament, I kind of want to walk through that with you a little bit and show you some of these reckless faith people. Don't you have trouble just praying for somebody in the Starbucks? Well, then when we look at the Old Testament, you're going to go, ah, okay, Lord, I'll pray for the person ordering the flat white. Okay. So Old Testament examples involve men and women who chose to act in faith in the middle of violent circumstances. It's not violent in the Starbucks. But you just, what if I'm wrong? What if you are? Who cares? They'll be blessed. Just don't be weird. Just don't be weird. Some of you need to take a lesson in that. Probably me. Me first. Okay. Sometimes in the Old Testament... Their immediate action was to carry out unpleasant, distressing directions from heaven. God's not asking you to carry out unpleasant, distressing messages from heaven. He's just saying, hey, that guy's ankle's sore. Why don't you just pray for it? Okay, you're not an Old Testament prophet. You're not the gloom and doomer. Just pray for the ankle and move on. Okay, they, they are bringing this heavy stuff toward cowardly, cowardly people and this impending evil on all sides. And here we are like, I can't do it, Lord. Just can't. Can't. Got to get my groceries. I can't. I, nope. Can't do it. It takes two minutes. Two minutes. I'm going to show you an amazing story in just, in just a few minutes of somebody who was just transformed from... A number one scoffer to, are you kidding me? This stuff's legit. Oh, my gosh. And then you couldn't keep him contained. And I will tell you his story that transpired in a 28-hour period because God can do that. All right. So let's look. You don't have to turn in your Bible unless you want to. I'm just going to paraphrase for time's sake. But look at Joshua and Caleb in Numbers chapter 
I think just the whole chapter of 13 and 14. Let me just summarize. So this is the part where 12 men are sent to explore the land, and the Lord was giving this land to the people of Israel. So the 12 men are sent to explore the land, but 10 of them cowered. And then they invented a connection of people they saw there to the giants, the Nephilim, and spread their opinions of fear rather than simply relaying their observations. None of us have ever done that. Never. Relaying our opinions of fear rather than simply just what's the observation. And they failed because of fear, and their emotions ran wild with panic. Anyone? Yeah? Five of us have had that happen. Nobody else. So meanwhile, though, contrast that with what happens here with the reckless faith people. Meanwhile, Joshua and Caleb stood firm in reckless faith, and they trusted the Lord at his word, at his word. They reported back their observations without any panic. I could use that sometimes without panic. God sent them, and they prevailed. And then later, Caleb was singled out for having a model spirit, I love that, in Numbers 14, 24. And then Joshua becomes the leader we know after the death of Moses. I want you to know something. God spiritually promotes the ones who continually trust him. It's true. It's true. Risk equals maturity. You want to grow up and be a mom and dad? Start risking. Start risking. All right, so then we're going to look at Joshua again in Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. So here, Joshua prays for the sun to stand still so the Israelites would defeat the Amorites. Who prays prayers like that? Do you pray prayers like that? I've never prayed prayers like that in my life until I went to Brazil. And then I went to Brazil, and there were a bunch of crazy people there, and I happened to get sucked up among them. And I was like, it was storming, and we weren't going to be able to do this crusade. I was just with those crazy people in England, and I told this story to them and reminded them, and I said, you know, that night was very strange because I don't think anyone had ever prayed prayers like that. The storm was so violent, they said, we're going to have to cancel this, and we're not going to be able to do this because it will be uh, electrocution with all the wires. It was an outside crusade for thousands of people, and it was a Randy Clark thing. And so Randy came over to us and said, I think we're going to cancel the whole thing. We said, no way. We're going to pray. We are here to pray for people. So all of us go out in the pouring down rain, and the cl it's just black, black skies. I'm telling you, it's one of the worst storms. And we stand there. I did not lead. I was actually kind of chicken to stand out there in the thunder and lightning, but I did it anyway because all those crazy people were doing it. So I went out there, and I put my hands up, and I just watched them. I'm going to do what they do. So they were like, Lord, and praying like Joshua for the clouds to part, and I was like, this is going to be good because these people are not backing down. We were out there 20 minutes. I mean, it wasn't like instantly. So we're like, blah, 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 blah. and all of a sudden, whew, the clouds part. I have pictures of it. I forgot them in all of my stuff that I sent to Amanda. I forgot those. But there was a circle of black clouds all the way around the land, but it wasn't in the middle pouring down rain everywhere else, thunder and lightning in the distance, but right over the crusade, it was dry. We saw the most crazy healings. We saw at least 10 people get out of wheelchairs that night. But, you know, when people aren't going to back down, they're going to go, no, God's going to do this because God's the one that invited us here, and we're not going to let any storm stop what God has planned. I learned a lot. I learned that I didn't have a whole lot of faith but I do now. So obviously I didn't pray hard enough for the hail to stop when I was flying in, but um, you know, next time, next time I will. All right, so Moses and Aaron in Exodus, Exodus 5, 1 through 21. So now you know Moses is 80 years old, right? And his brother, and they're persuaded by the Lord to go to Pharaoh and ask for the Israelites to get some rest. How popular is that? The Israelites hate Moses and Aaron, and they have Pharaoh, the Egyptians, and the Israelites boxing them in, and, and then they still do what God asks. How reckless did their faith have to be? When we don't accept the invitation from God to go where he's asking us to go, we miss the blessing. I can tell you that. We miss the blessing. I didn't really want to go to New Zealand. It was very far a few weeks ago. I was thinking, man, that's far. That's like close to the South Pole. It's like on the other side of the world. 
And it took forever to get there. And when I landed there, I knew why I was there. It was one of those moments in time where the Lord is saying things to you. You don't know anything about anything, but I knew this stuff was important, so I wrote it down. And it's too long to get into, but I will just say this. Because I said yes, the Lord used me in a way I couldn't even imagine. I couldn't imagine the prophetic words that he gave me about the land that was there and the people that had been there before. I couldn't know any of that stuff. And I get invited to these closed door meetings where I don't know anyone. And then somebody leans over and goes, who the heck are you, Joe Moody? I go, I don't even know who I am. I don't know what I'm here for. He goes, say what you came to say. And I get up and say, it's like the Lord had given me a history on the land and the college and the people and the stuff. And I'm standing there in shock thinking, who am I? Because I simply said yes. And then I had to say yes every day when I was choking, like, oh my gosh, what if I'm wrong? Well, who cares? They'll never see me again if I'm wrong. <laughs> but in fact, I'm going back in July because it was just so amazing. So when you say yes to the inconvenient, it's probably God. It's probably God. All right, so here I want to, since I'm talking about New Zealand, I want to, um, I'm going to call this kid Marcus. Okay, so... <laughs> All right, so, so this is a bunch of y whammers. I love y whammers. They're awesome. Try not to get their faces because they, they don't like us to put their faces out there. But this kid in this HRA, HSA, whatever that shirt says there. So he's a kid from the East Coast, and he's kind of a bad boy. Uh, just don't really know much about his history, except that I ended up at a lunch table where he was sitting one day. Uh, this is my second day that I'm there. And I just get one of those drive-by prophetic words where I go, hey, listen, blah, 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 blah. And he just falls over in his chair, and I'm like, well, that was fun. I got to go. So I get up, and I leave. But, you know, the things were, you're an adrenaline junkie, and you're this, and you're that, and you're, you know, wild. And you're so, and wow, your mom sent you here to straighten you up. You know, it was one of those kind of words. Anyway, so he was pretty much like he was the scoffer on the first day. So you get the drive-by prophetic words, so then he's kind of like, who are you, you weirdo old lady? And, you know, all that. But then he's starting to feel the presence of God. So I taught them how to pray for the sick. So here they are in groups, and there's, there's hundreds of them. And they're praying for this guy because he is an adrenaline junkie. He jumped off a cliff, and he pulled his hamstring, and he had, like, strawberry all the way down to his leg down there. And he just could hardly, he couldn't sit down. So I didn't know any of this. This is all later. So they're praying for him. Now, this guy on the left is totally in trouble every single day. This kid right here with the red hair. Every day. What are you doing? Hey, get up. Stop that. Quit it. So these are all, and this guy on this <laughs> knees down here, these are the troublemakers. The four troublemakers in the group right here praying for this troublemaker. <laughs> I mean, all week long, I'm like, I'm ready to kill these kids. I'm just ready to kill them. What's wrong with these four? So let's go to the next slide. So they're praying for him. I'm going to call him Marcus. Okay, look at his face. Okay, there's a whole series of these pictures. They're absolutely priceless. He's like, you got to be kidding me. This kid right here with a plaid shirt on has got his hands like this. Like, he's like, did I, did I pray for that? And like, you don't have any pain? Like, this kid's got, what? If you could see his face. And he's like, huh? It's so, okay, go to the next slide. Okay, this is the greatest thing. So this is him now giving a testimony. You can't believe it. I mean, he pulls up his pants all the way up here. We're like, that's a little bit too, TMI. Put your pant leg down. He's showing everybody like he doesn't, and he's just lit. And this kid's over here like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, he, this is another one of the troublemakers. So these troublemakers are now in a, in a group. None of them, he's Canadian, New Jersey, you know, Canada. They're, they're not together, but now they're together because the Lord is moving. So he's given this testimony. So hold that picture right there, and then we'll go back to the other one. So I'm telling you this because this is how fast reckless faith sets in. This is like, this is over a period of a day and a half. So this kid in the middle, he is so lit by the Lord. And there's, there are 22 back healings that day. 22 backs, and these kids have major medical stuff going on, and there's knees, and there's crutches being thrown down. I mean, it's a wild time, okay? This kid is so enamored by the Lord, he ends up going back to his room that night, or, or that afternoon, to the dorm room. So that night, this same day that this is happening, I run a Q&A, because I always believe in doing that with the kids, because they have a million questions. So we're doing a Q&A. It's voluntary. You can come. Of course, all of the hundreds of kids are all there, because they're like, I got a question. So he comes running in late. I have to give a testimony. I have to give a testimony. I'm like, hang on a second. I'm in the middle of a point. Just a minute. So I say what I'm going to say, and then come up here. Come up. So he comes up, and he goes, you're never going to believe this. You're never going to believe this. I'm like, I, I would believe it. Just go ahead. So <laughs> 
He says, so, you know, yeah, my mom, like, you were right. My mom sent me here. You know, like, she's going to straighten me out and blah, blah, and all that. And everything you said. And he goes, but, you know, my buddy and I, we got in this wreck right before I came. We, we took this golf cart, and we crashed this golf cart. And my buddy broke his ankle, and he's got screws and pins, and he had surgery last week. And so this crazy healing that Jesus is doing, I FaceTimed him. I'm like, great. Everybody's like this. Because they're like watching this kid transform right before their eyes. And he goes, so I, I said, hey, man, put the cell phone on your ankle. <laughs> this kid is so gutsy. I wouldn't even think of that. So he's FaceTiming his friend Chris all the way back in New Jersey. And he goes, put the thing on. So Chris puts the thing on his ankle. And he's going, in the name of Jesus, everything he learned. I command all this pain to leave and this ankle to be fully functional. And then he shows us video of his friend running up and down the stairs. He was in a wheelchair. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> you know, Jesus is awesome. He knows how to captivate us, doesn't he? I mean, he's the least likely. This kid is the least likely. And here he is. He's on fire. He's got, he's like, you wouldn't believe it. Like, there's no way he could have done that. Yeah, and I'm like, Totally calm down. Sit right here. <laughs> He's just told okay, go back to that slide right before that. Okay, so this is very funny. So the last night we're there, I have, um, we're in this huge meeting. It's, it's a very big deal. We got invited to go to this, this kind of covenant community celebration thing between to a Bible college that's been there 50 years in YWAM. It was, it was a very priceless moment. I don't know how I got invited, but so all the kids are there, and I'm in worship. I get this impression from the Lord. I, so you need to act on impressions, okay? If, if they don't contradict the nature of God, you might want to just go try that because it might be an encouragement for someone, right? So I walk around the room looking for the troublemakers, um, and I see them all collectively together. Now, before all the healings broke out, they were not together. Now they're in a cluster. They're sitting side by side, and it's in the middle of worship. And I walk over, and I go, uh, gentlemen, they perk up when I say that because no one's ever called them gentlemen in their lives. So I said, gentlemen, uh, there's a man back there with a cane. He's in big pain, and I had better see the four of you praying for him before the end of the night. Got it? And they go, yes, mama, we got it. And they go like this to each other, boys, we got an assignment. They <laughs> cracked me up before, and this is the ringleader now with the beard. Before the next song, they all go running over. I didn't say the next song, but they did. They ran over to the guy. So then our photographers on our team snapped these pictures. This man in the red hat came in just barely being able to move. He's so much pain. And I think beyond the next slide, there's one more. They're all on their knees, and they're all crying because Jesus heals this man. It is unbelievable. And when I go back over where, after worship, I go where they're sitting, and I go, hey, I'm proud of you guys. And they go, they start crying again. Now, these are tough kids. I mean, they're like, and they look at me. They go, you don't get it. You don't get it. I go, tell me. What's up? And one of them goes, okay, you remember when you told us how we could hear the voice of God? And I go, mm -hmm. you can, right? And they said, well, one of the girls, she was checking it out. She was trying it out. And she came up to us right after class. And she said, you four are going to pray with a man with a red hat today. And he's going to get healed. That man has a red hat, Joe. <laughs> it's okay. I continue to receive video from New Zealand from these people who can't, can't hardly keep them on the base anymore. They want to go off into the city and pray for everyone. Because that's what happens. Amen? All right. Thanks, Jesus. God is stunning. He's absolutely stunning. When we were in uh, St. Andrews just, just a couple days ago, I looked around the room, you know, and, and all the pillars were getting touched by God. But then I look around at the, the young ones, and I'm like, what are they doing? They're just sitting there. So I looked at all the parents, and I go like this to all the kids, and I go, I call all the kids down the front, took this little nine-year-old girl. Her name was Pip. I just loved her. I loved her name. Pip. What a name. So great. And I said, hey, you want to pray for some people? Yes, I do. They became the prayer team. Took them around to pray for everyone. 
And on the last night that I was there, Pip's dad was standing there. Now, Pip's dad had been serving everyone, and she pulls him all the way up to the front, and she says, now, Joe, we need to pray for my dad. Those moments are priceless. I didn't know her dad was suffering from what they call ME, which is what we, uh, it's autoimmune dysfunction. It's kind of in the MS family, we call it here. And um, he had started having symptoms again. And uh, so he, he felt he had been healed a year ago. So Pip and I prayed for the dad. And uh, the dad had such an encounter with the Lord, and we won't know for a while whether he was healed, but we do believe he was healed. But Pip learned how to do emotional healing with her own father. It was absolutely incredible. So I've gotten some reports from St. Andrews that all the kids are on fire and that the youth leader has no idea what to do now. So I said, <laughs> uh, call Michael over at St. Paul's in the next city. He's three years ahead of you with this whole youth thing, and he can help you. This is how we do things with the body of Christ. If one group gets it, you need to give it away to the next group, and you need to be encouraging to one another. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's look at Gideon, and then we're going to jump to the New Testament. There are so many heroes of faith in this. Gideon in Judges 7, 1 through 22. You know, he's the least of these, isn't he? He's the least of the 12 tribes, and he's the least in his family. And where does God say, mighty man? He's hiding. He's hiding, and God calls him a mighty man. So the army with Gideon is whittled down to 300 men through whom Gideon will defeat the Midianites who number 120,000. Whoa. So Gideon is so confident at this time that God is with them. He divides his men into three companies and told them to blow their trumpets and crash their pots to follow his lead and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. I can't imagine that. For the Lord and for Joan. No, I don't think so. No. <laughs> And then the 300 trumpets sounded, and the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with swords. That's in verse 22. Outrageous faith. Don't you want some of that? At every odd, these people turned and said, no, I'm going to follow God. Not what it looks like. Who God is is what I'm going to do. And we have trouble with all this freedom. We live in a world of freedom, and we can't pray for the sick. What is wrong with us? We have got to do it. I'm telling you, it will never get easier in your stomach, probably. I, I think that's true. I think it's good to have a little bit of nervousness. You might actually need God. I don't know I do. Okay. Rahab, Jeremiah. How about Phineas? Come on. Phineas in Numbers 25 runs a spear through the Israelite man having a time with a Midianite woman. And he ends up satisfying the sacrifice as an atonement for idolatry of the Israelites at that time. You know, it's amazing. There's Ehud and Judges, and there's David coming against Goliath, and there's Jonathan protecting, protecting David from his own father. He's the heir. How much faith does it take? How much reckless faith? Daniel, Ezekiel. And I, I think when we read the Bible, at least me, I look at these people and I think, oh, they're superhuman. But they were just ordinary. They were so ordinary. They were just like us. So let's jump to the New Testament. And we'll look at John the Baptist. Luke 3, 1 through 19. And Mark 6, 14 through 29. You know, when you think about it in context, and you think John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. And then he's assigned the role of scout for the followers of Jesus. And he was so weird. He was so weird. I, I, I look at him and I think, thank you, God, that we don't have that anymore. <laughs> and when he comes against King Herod, he loses his head. But his ministry did what it was supposed to do. He was obedient before the Lord, and he blessed the arrival of the Messiah, and that was his fulfillment of his assignment. I don't want to stand before the Lord and say, God, I missed. I missed because you invited me, and I said, no. I'm going to stay home and watch reruns, whatever, lame show we all sit in front of. I want to go where the Lord is moving. Don't you want to do that? How about Jesus with the money changers? I looked at that story in a whole different light. <clears throat> because I never really realized that the high priests are the ones who allowed Passover to be a time of making money. Even for their own gain. 
And then when Jesus overturns the tables and undermines their earning potential. Wow, what kind of risk is that? High cost. And Jesus models continually taking a stand against religious people. How many religious people look at you and go, really? And then we do one of two things. We, sh we shrink back or we go, don't judge me. I'll judge you. Don't do either of those. Just stand your ground and say, I bless you. I bless you. Ask the Lord for an encouraging word for him. You just might prophesy and knock their socks off, and you can go, God bless you, and walk off. It's great. Done it a million times. So awesome. How about Nathaniel? I love Nathaniel in John 1, 43 through 51. He's the first person to recognize Jesus was the Son of God and the King of Israel. These proclamations would have been blasphemous to conventional, conventional Judaism. How would you like to be that guy? Blasphemer. And you just keep on saying it. You just keep on saying it. It's getting easier to pray for the person in Starbucks the more I talk, isn't it? Yeah. How about the woman with the issue of blood? I love her story. I always talk about her. Risking being stoned to death. She comes to Jesus for her healing. When he proclaims her faith made her well, and he uses that sozo term, it's her mind, her body, her soul. And he protects her. By proclaiming her well, he protects her from further ridicule, from further embarrassment from further attack, meaning if the people are going to say that, she can say, no, the rabbi pronounced me clean. I, there are so many people in this world desperate to know that God exists, God cares about them, God sees them, God will heal them, and he just wants to use ordinary people like you and me to do it. Like that kid, Marcus, praying for his friend in New Jersey. That friend is shocked. He isn't even a believer. He is now. He is now. There was a woman that was wheeled in. I was in Oklahoma a couple months ago. And there was a woman that was wheeled in in a wheelchair. And when she was wheeled in, I was in the hall. I wasn't even in the service yet. And I took a look at her, and I felt like the Lord said to me, well, that, those days are gone. I was like, well, okay then. Meaning, get up and walk. It was going to be one of those. I just... Felt like he said, don't even pray for her. Just tell her to get up and walk. I was like, well, this will be fun. And at the, you know, toward the end of the service, we're praying for people. And I just walked over there and I said, what's your name? You know, just call her Dorothy. Hey, Dorothy, get up and walk. I can't. I go, no, you can. Actually, right now, don't say a thing. Get up and walk. And the pastor's over there laughing. I'm like, I guess she's kind of bossy. But I was bossier. It was great, you know. <laughs> so I just said, get up and walk. And I said, I'm going to take your arm right now and you are going to walk. And in that moment, I just felt faith being released in her there was something in me that, that was absolutely all Jesus, completely believing for her what she couldn't believe for herself. Do you know that that's true for all of you? You can believe for somebody what they can't believe for themselves. I said, I'll hold you up, but you're not going to sit in that chair anymore. And so she holds my arms, and she's shaky, and she gets up, and then I get two guys from the room. I'm like, hey, come here. I said, hold her up under her arms. And I go, now, don't look down. Stop looking down. Let's, we're going to walk together. And I just told her who she was. We walked all around the church. And by the time we'd made one lap, she wasn't walking with anybody holding her up. She was just walking. She was just strolling. She was just going along like this because I told her who she was. What a privilege. It took about four and a half minutes. And it was staggering because faith was released all over the church. And then the little kids were like, I want to do that. Four and five-year-olds. That's what happens when you say yes, when you say yes. How about Stephen in Acts 6, 8? He's a Grecian Jew. He's performing miracles once the disciples laid their hands on him, and some of the religious men produced false witness against Stephen. And before the Sanhedrin council, he explains himself using only what? Scripture. That's it. And his face shone like the face of an angel. And even through his persecution, his stoning, he remained steadfast to Jesus and proclaimed heaven's glory on earth. I want that to be true of us. That to be true. We're not popular. Sometimes we're not popular because we come into religious establishments and we just begin to love people. And we love them and it's messy and sometimes the Holy Spirit does weird stuff. I hope some of you come to that training we're having on the 17th because one of the breakout sessions we're having is weird manifestations of the Bible and the explanation for it. 
because that is, that happens. People's face shine like the sun. And people go, well, that's not God. Really? Well, we'll walk you through scripture and show you how that is God. Why are there strange things that happen? Because the Lord is not like us. He is higher in all his ways. And so there are so many things here. I want to read you, um, I think this is the next slide. I want to read you Acts 4, 1 through 22. Watch what happens when they don't back down. Are you okay? You're right? Okay. So Peter and John were talking about, and this is Acts 4, 1 through 22. So, and as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. I love that. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem, and with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, and all who were of the priestly, high priestly family. And when they had set them, in, set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now watch what happens. So they're like, you know what? You blew it. He was the cornerstone. Sorry, you don't have that anymore. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. That's my favorite part. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another saying this, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and we can't deny it. But in order that it may be spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John answered them, eh, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Period. The end. When you see signs, wonders, and miracles happen to you, you cannot but speak about that. No matter the opposition, no matter the persecution, you must speak about the truth of what God is doing because the word further says, and when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. Because when the people hear the testimony, all were praising God for what happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old old. Regardless of the consequences to them, the disciples continue to proclaim the truth of Jesus. Reckless faith opens the door for Jesus to heal people and to release signs and wonders through ordinary people. Let me tell you the story of a kid named Landon. Landon went to Bethel School of Ministry. He's prayed for people for five years. He came on a trip with us. He drove from Spokane, Washington, up to Port Angeles. I paid for his gas because I wanted him to be there. He's a poor college kid. I'm like, hey, if you come, God's going to do something. I'm going to pay for your gas and put you up in a hotel. I don't normally do that, but I felt like it was the Lord. I'm not telling you that to brag. I'm telling you that because sometimes there's an opportunity you get to join with God and go, hey, I'm going to take care of this. So Landon came by faith, drove all that way, about eight hours, 
And he gets there and he goes, well, I just got to tell you, man, I've prayed for so many people and nobody's ever gotten healed. I go, well, that's about to change. He prayed for people with us for three days and every single person he prayed for was healed. Every single person. Yes, Jesus. I'm telling you, he had some person who had their toes like this, frozen like this. And I walked by when he was praying and the toes went like this, boom. And I was like, come on. I just started laughing. He had so much faith, nobody could shut him up. I mean, he was just, and he went home and he did the same thing and infected his whole church, infected his family. He's on fire for the Lord, but sometimes you get an opportunity to partner with somebody else's greatness. You need to pay attention to those things. He's a rock star for Jesus. He just never was given the opportunity to have somebody say, today's the day, now you're going to do it. He was one of a crowd. He needed to be an individual because he's a general in God's army. I could recognize that. And before he used to be part of the crowd, and he wasn't, wasn't given that kind of promotion in faith. Do you know what I'm saying? All right, so I feel like when we look at what Jesus modeled and paid for on the cross, you can't miss this. It's the reckless love of the Father. It's the reckless love of the Father that gave Jesus the strength to endure. And it's the same for us. You can't go out and do all this crazy stuff without intimacy. It's just going to fry you. Because you won't know what to say yes to and what to say no to. Amen? There are invitations and things to do that are actually not yours. They belong to somebody else. So you have to be okay. When there are things that come my way and people want me to speak at some conference, I go, well... What's that conference for? And if they tell me and it doesn't line up with what I know God's called me to do, I say no. I don't care who's speaking. It doesn't matter to me. I only want to do what I'm supposed to do. I am called to raise up a generation. So if the generation's not going to be there, why am I there? It's just making me tired. I'm not going. So I say, do you have young people there? Uh, well, there's three. Well, no, maybe that's not for me. But maybe it is. I don't know. You have to ask God, what's my assignment for today, Lord? What am I supposed to be about? And everything that Jesus modeled, you know, every scripture, I would write these all down if I were you. Uh, Mark 135, very early in the morning while it's still dark, Jesus gets up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place and prayed. There's a cost. There's a cost to doing these wild things. The cost is you can't be at every party. You can't be at every chat you got to get alone with God. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Luke 5, 15 and 16, and Mark 1, 45. Here's why. I, I really believe this with my whole heart because I've had to learn this the hard way. To be with our Heavenly Father in intimacy is where our identity is assured. This is where we draw on to receive the fullness of Christ in us, all of the love and the power and the authority. If you don't do that, you will start to depend on what other people have to say about you, and that will fry you because there's a lot of people that don't like what we do. And there's a lot of people that love what we do for the wrong thing, wrong reasons. There's a lot of weirdness out there, and you have to stay focused. So when you look at after, after everything was done, after Jesus had dismissed the crowds, he then still went back to the mountainside by himself to pray. And when evening came, he's still up there alone. They serve great cheese in England. I got to tell you, just great cheese. I, there's a segue here. I know you guys are like, what is she talking about? Every night after we get done ministering, there are plates of cheese. I love cheese. I love it so much, they gave me like this five-pound brick to take home to my husband, and I forgot it. Oh. I know, very sad. <laughs> but every night, it's like a party after the party, and every night, I couldn't go because I need to go back to be with God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Being with the Lord to just say thanks, Papa, for what you just did. I don't have to be religious. I just know I want to be with him. He just did something so extraordinary. And so I can eat cheese two nights. I don't have to eat cheese every night. I can go up to my room and be with the one that I love who did all that stuff for me. You don't have to miss life 
but you do have to miss some things if you really want to hear what's on the Lord's heart for the day. All right. Let me give you a couple of things. When you are wanting to do what Jesus has asked you to do, number one, you have to walk fearlessly. The Bible says, do not fear 365 times. Not lost on you, is it, at all? One for every day. 40 verses of scripture on fear. It's a, it permeates our young people, permeates our culture. Joshua 1, 9. Do not fear. Be strong and courageous. I have not, I've commanded you that. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Number two, when you choose the Father's presence, so all of this framework is choosing God first, choosing the Father's presence above everything else. When you do that, you can speak the truth of the Father's will, doing only what he says and only what he is doing, regardless of the consequences. The big risk. The big risk. His will above everything else. Let me say this. When Jesus waited four days to raise Lazarus from the dead, we all look at that story and go, what is that about? I'm just going to put this out there because I read it and I was like, well, that's kind of weird. But without the Father's direction, Jesus might have rushed right there. He might have. He might have. Glory was revealed in greater measure because of the weight. Man, we don't want to hear that, do we? My, my weight for my healing was 14 and a half years. Nobody wanted to wait less than me. But here we are on this side of it. I'm going, come on, Lord. Would it have been this impactful if it hadn't been 14 and a half years and 13 surgeries? Maybe not. Maybe a book wouldn't have been written. Maybe I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I don't know. All I can say is God works everything together for good for those who are called according to his good purposes. Amen? So Jesus said Lazarus died to reveal the glory of God. That's what he said. It's very interesting because I think that when I had my near-death experience in France, I believe that was for the glory of God. I believe my healing was for the glory of God. I believe all of this time and space and everything that I'm doing now is for God's glory. I could stay home and say no. God's not going to love me less, but boy, would I miss the fun. So I believe God's inviting you into his party. When you choose the Father's presence, it opens you up to be the hands and feet and voice of Jesus in situations where people cut themselves off. We got to pray for a woman in Brazil who was blind. And I, I said, God, I just want to pray for this woman myself, nobody else, because that's kind of how I am sometimes. I just said, I've never seen a blind person get healed when I pray. Other people have prayed, but I just want to pray by myself. So I prayed for the woman by myself, and she started screaming in Portuguese, somebody turn the light on, somebody turn the light on, somebody turn the light on, on this side, in this eye. She had gone blind after seeing her brother murdered. So after leading her through emotional healing and the removal of trauma is when the sight began to come back. And that's how good God is. I said before I left for Brazil last year, I want to see a blind person regain their sight. Father, I just want to see that. I want to see you do that. I want to give you glory in that way. That's not selfish. I want that for that person. And so these radical situations where people cut themselves off, you will be the catalyst for their healing if you say yes. If you say yes. All right, I want to show you where people are the hands and feet of Jesus in some of the worst places where people won't go. Um, will you show those slides? This is Rio de Janeiro. There's your Kathy Gove. This guy was a heroin addict, and um, he just got clean, and he came to the church, and he served on this team building a uh, home in, in the flavela, in the slums there, where there's no running water and no electricity. There's no nothing there. It's just a hovel. And uh, he was just so broken. He'd never done anything like this in his life. And Kathy just holding him. I mean, he'd been working. They'd been working for days straight. They smelled not awesome. And uh, there's Kathy just holding on to him. You can go to the next one. We are praying with a pastor there for this land. This whole strip, this whole area is 
prostitution and, and uh, gambling and drugs. And, and we're praying. His church is here, right smack in the middle of all this. And we are praying, you know what, Jesus, this, this land belongs to you. We're right out in the middle of the bars. The bars are all around us. Saying yes to Jesus will cause you to do radical things like this. Okay, go to the next one. Radical faith is choosing to just say yes. Reckless faith, just say yes and pray for the one in front of you every time. Can you go to the next one? So this is the home they built. And the homes normally look like this one. There's no roof on that one. And it's just open. There's no doors. There's no windows. There's no plumbing. There's no electricity. There's no bathrooms. And generations are growing up like this. And their parents are alcoholics and prostitutes and they're uneducated. And it was only four years ago that the government of Brazil started to make children go to school. So these children are now going to school that live in the favela and they're actually being tutored by the people in the church because their parents are illiterate. So you can make a difference in the lives of one person, but you have to have reckless faith. I think there's one more slide. Yeah, so this is what they typically, they live in if there's even this kind of wall, which is, which is brick. All right, number four. Choosing the Father's presence first allows us to be abandoned for God, wholly surrendered without restraint, and at peace with what will happen next. The peace of God that transcends all understanding can be yours in the midst of fire or in the midst of weight. You can always have peace. Choosing the Father's presence allows us to love those who are not very lovable or who don't return our love. Choosing the Father's love can cause you to honor people around you who do not deserve to be honored. Without a culture of honor, you will not see miracles. It doesn't happen. Choosing the Father's presence first will allow us all to forgive when forgiveness is not justifiable by the world's standards. And it always makes people wonder how that's possible. <laughs> For God so loved the world, and God forgave us first 70 times 7. It doesn't mean you have to have a relationship with a toxic person. Your forgiveness and leading someone else through forgiveness is a vertical thing. It's between God and the person. It does not automatically mean that there is some reconciliation if reconciliation isn't safe. Are you getting my point? Okay. And lastly, choosing the Father's presence first changes the direction of our lives even when it doesn't make sense. He will orchestrate the season and connect you. Connect the dots. It's the craziest thing when you begin to run with God in the way that our team does, when you see the world is much smaller than we presume, that there are people connected to people that are connected to people, and you go, what in the world? How did you get over here? Right before I left for New Zealand, I did a conference in the Bay Area. Fifty-three churches were present. That is absolutely unheard of. 53 churches, and in that meeting was Francis Chan's wife. And sh they have 20 house churches in San Francisco. And they are very interested now in learning the biblical basis for healing. That man has changed San Francisco, the whole Tenderloin District, but he had not seen this kind of unity in the region. But it's unity... Because people have been praying. So I go back to my point. Reckless faith that's necessary for signs, wonders, and miracles has to start with intercession. Intimacy and intercession. And don't we all want to do that? That should be a matter of lifestyle. So let me close with this. I could go on and on. You know, we just read the word of God and it's so rich about the truth, the kind of faith we've been granted as believers in Christ. And it's audacious, fearless, reckless, attainable faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. But I think it's all down to hunger. And I think that living by this, Luke 7, 35, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I say to you, 
The wisdom of God will be proven true by the expressions of godliness in everyone that follows me. Godliness in each of us is doing what Jesus did, not picking and choosing. It's impossible to fulfill the destiny God has for your life if you don't. There is so much more than what you're currently living. So much more. You are the generation to raise up a generation. It's on you, because who's going to? A lot of the kids that come in here, their families go here, but a lot of them don't. And this is a safe house, an amazing house, with amazing mature people here. We love it here. So would you let us pray for you? I'm going to have our prayer team come up, and if the Rock prayer team's here, would you stand up? I just am asking the Lord to impart audacious faith to you tonight. You know, it, it's not going to be a perfect time for you to get faith. You live in a broken world, and you will have trials of every kind. You can pay back the enemy for what he's doing to your family by getting out there and praying for other people. So, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come. Just close your eyes and put your hands out. Holy Spirit, come. 